To create a believable space in a painting, you need to create depths. But how do we do that when we are painting on a flat piece of paper? I'm sure you already know how because you are looking at those things every day. Hi, this is Eric from Cafe Watercolor. Recently, I went to Cannon Beach in Oregon. It's the first time I was there. Even though I've seen countless photos of the place, seeing it in person was an amazing experience. I took some photos of the scenery. Even though I think I can never do it justice, I still want to give it a try in painting it. The most distinct element in this scene is the depths. So I thought it's appropriate for me to talk about creating depths in a painting today. Now, when trying to paint a believable scenery painting, creating depths is very important. Doesn't matter if it is a cityscape, nature landscape, or even still life, some subjects can feel more obvious than others, but the concept applies to pretty much all of them. So today I'm going to share with you how to work with the three basic elements to create depths in a painting. These elements are not just for watercolor, they are basic principles for every painting. Most of the time, the depth is created by at least two of these elements. And in the case of this scene, all three applied. Number one, value and contrast. If a scene doesn't have a direct light source, such as an overcast day, you can see it very clear that scenes are much lighter and lower in contrast in the distance than they are up close. That's because there is a lot more atmosphere in between covered them up. This is most obvious during a foggy morning. Without an atmosphere, we won't be alive, but we also won't be able to perceive depths the same way. If you ever get to travel to the the moon, this is what you're going to see. Aside from the scale of the rocks and the sharpness of the image, the value is pretty similar throughout. That's due to the lack of atmosphere on the moon's surface. Even on a sunny day, things that are further away are going to have less contrast than what's up close, because the light on the atmosphere will make the dark in distance appear to be lighter. Number two, color. Similar to value and contrast, things that are further away are much less saturated because the colors we see are made of light. The further things are away from you, the longer distance light has to travel to reach your eyes. Some of the colors of light got absorbed into the atmosphere. During a sunny day, the color blue got absorbed the most by the atmosphere. That's why the sky is blue and things that are further away are bluer. The color red can travel longer distance than blue. That's why at sunrise and sunset, when the sun is further away from us, we see mostly red and orange. And by the way, this is why we should try to eliminate blue light at night, because our body associates blue light to daytime. It will suppress your body produce melatonin, makes it harder to relax and go to sleep. Anyways, this is not a science channel, so the simple way to remember is that things that are further away have closer overall color to the sky. Should have said that first and save you some time, sorry. And number three, sharpness. Our eyes has a visual range. Even if you have 20-20 perfect eyesight, you are not able to see things that are a mile away as clearly as they are five feet close to you. Unless you are an eagle that has a two mile of visual range and can see UV colors, things will look more blurry and less detailed in a distance. So sharpness and adding the variance of less saturated color and contrast into the mix, you will be able to make things look very far away. All these elements are what you can see in the real world because of the atmosphere. So next time when you are outside, take some time to observe. And what's important is to understand them and push them in your own painting. Remember, we are creating optical illusions on a flat surface. So dial those elements up a bit to create better depths. Okay, now let's take a look at the process of this painting. Before we start, if you like my video, please consider giving a like and subscribe. Ring the bell icon so you won't miss out more video like this one. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so let's talk about the process of this painting. So first of all, I apologize for the camera setup for the palette. It was still in the position for my last painting, which is a portrait painting. The palette was smaller, so I forgot to adjust that. Fortunately, the color for this specific painting is pretty simple. So I did a pretty simple line drawing. This scenery is pretty much all organic shape. There is no man-made shape such as building and stuff. 
so it's relatively forgiving. You don't need to make it exactly the same as the photo. The important thing is to get the placement and the scale relatively close, though. So one of the beauties in this scenery is the sense of scale. So if you're comparing the figures to the background rocks, the sense of scale is really, really nice, really, really beautiful. Those rocks look massive comparing to the scale of the figure. So those are the things that I want to capture. So I switched to a mechanical pencil and did some small figures. The shape language is very important since they are very, very small. There's not a lot of detail to make them look more like figure than just a silhouette. And watch out for the perspective. All of the figures are standing on the same flat surface. So all of the heads of the figures should lining up pretty nicely since they all share the same eye level. If the figure position is way off, then the whole place is not going to feel as flat as it should be. So I'm making some mark for the shoreline, the puddles. And by the way, this full length demo, the unedited one, is part of the bonus for my watercolor essential course. I just uploaded it. So if you're interested, definitely check it out. If you're already enrolled, look out for my email. So in my unedited video, I talk while I paint so I can share every single step of the process. This is a free bonus content that I continuously update for the people who enrolled my course. Anyway, so I pre mixed some color for my first wash, which is the sky and some of the sand color. So the sky is mostly just cobalt blue, cerulean blue with a little bit of burnt umber to neutralize the blue so it's not going to be as saturated. And I pre wet the sky portion of the painting. There's no need to leave out any white for this particular painting because nothing is really that bright. Everything is kind of foggy and even the bright in the sky or in the reflection puddles, it doesn't have to be completely white. So while the paper is still wet, I start to paint some soft clouds and also the background mountain especially the one in the middle, half of it is covered in fog. So some wet on wet work for the background and I clean my brush. I squeeze out the moisture to keep my brush damp. And I use that to soften some edges and lift up some paint so I can get more foggy effect in the distance. So I'm mixing a thicker mixture while the paper is still moist just to get a little bit more defined shape in the background. So they're still in the distance, they're still pretty soft, but they're just a little bit more defined than rest of the background, just so that we have a little bit more distant varieties in the background. And at this stage, the sky is done. So whether you like it or not, it's better to leave it alone. The more you mess with it, the less fresh it's going to look and you are running into the risk for getting cauliflower edges. So now I add some more burn umber, get more thicker mixtures for me to paint the middle ground. So the middle ground mountain obviously is a lot darker. So I didn't do a value study for this one, but if I would, the middle ground mountain is going to be the middle value. While the background and the sky, the puddles, they are going to be light value. So here I finished the middle ground mountain for the left. I'm just using a clean water just to bring that pigment down to get it a little bit lighter. And again, it's some wet on to wet work, add just a little bit more mixtures into the background, get a little bit more varieties, some more thickness, a little bit of textures, soft details. And as soon as I paint the middle ground, you can immediately see the sense of depth just by changing the value, changing the sharpness and adding a little bit more color. Painting the middle ground rock on the right. And again, I soften the bottom with a damp brush just to get that sense of ground fog. 
and I try not to use a brush that is too small for things like these. I want a decent sized brush that holds enough mixture so I can finish a shape with as few brush stroke as I can to keep things cleaner and look fresher. And now I continue that wash down all the way down with some lighter blue and such. This will be the color of the water puddles and the shoreline. And at the very bottom, I transition that into the sand just to get that transition from shallow water shoreline to sand. And this is what makes watercolor so beautiful because it can transition from one color to another so naturally and so effortlessly if you have the grasp of the wetness. Now while that wash is still moist, I added some color for the sand. The edges will be somewhat soft because the paper is still moist, still a little bit damp, but it's going to look defined enough. So we start to have some separations between the sand and the water. So for the sand, I add a little bit of yellow ochre just to get a little bit more yellow introduced into the sand. But I also add just a little bit of burnt sienna and even a little bit of alizarin crimson just to introduce a little bit of purple in it. And while the wash is still moist, I add some more dark color. So I got a little bit of a transition between the light and the dark sand. Get a nice clean damp brush, a small brush, to lift some of the paint on the background to suggest there's a little house back there. It doesn't really need to be really defined, it just needs to be subtly there. Just for people to kind of make out there might be something there while it is not really that defined. So I come back to the middle ground and add some more rock in the mid ground. Now the bottom ground fog is dry. I can paint in front of that. and try to connect that to the rock on the right. Again, keep those shapes simple and don't overdo it. They are the middle ground, but they are still pretty far away actually. So we don't need anything really dark and pop out. There's another rock on the left, so I paint that in. Just a tiny little bit darker than the big rock, the hill on the back. And because watercolor will dry lighter, so you do compensate a little bit. And if it end up to be a little bit too dark, you might able to go back with clean water and just press it with paper towel. So now I'm painting tiny little figures with a smaller brush. And again, those are very, very tiny, very, very little. They are just dots. But still, try to watch out for the shape that you're painted. Instead of just end up looking like a bunch of little blobs, try to make sense out of them. Maybe give in a little bit of head, some shoulder, and thin straight legs, and so on. So these two figures on the right, they are more or less the main figures and they are pretty dark actually. Even in a photo, we don't really see the skin tone or anything else. So just focus on painting good silhouette and good shape. I added a dog next to them because there are some people who bring in dog and walking along the shore. So I thought that would be interesting to have additional scale reference. So just add a little bit of textures on the sand. I try to keep everything as subtle as possible though. This painting really doesn't scream for details or textures and things like that. So I'm making part of the sand a little bit darker. The previous wash dry a little bit too light than what I want. So I need to darken some of the areas. This painting end up look quite a bit like an illustration just because the simplicity of the value and the textures. 
but the scenery itself looks like a painting. So I'm just suggesting a little bit of the reflections on the puddles. And I'm looking at it again, see where else do I need to fill? Where do I need to define a little bit more? The house on the left in the distance, tiny little bit of dark. And now when I scream my eyes, I feel the sand and the water puddles feels a little bit too similar in value. So I decided to give it a glaze to separate the sand from the wet puddles, the wet surface, just a little bit more. So as you can see, as soon as I put down that glaze, the contrast between the sand and the water is a lot more clear. And this is what we want. While things in the distance, I'm not going to touch. We want it to remain more into the distance. So just add a little bit more dark, soft details here and there while it is still damp. And here is the finished painting. I actually come back to it and lighten some of the middle ground rocks by going over them with clean water and just press them with paper towel to lift some of the paint up. So that helps the depths a little bit more. Hope you like this painting and this quick demo. Hope that was helpful for you. Creating believable depths is to help the viewer to experience the scenery you are seeing. So keep those three elements in mind to share your experience visually. That's it for today's video. You can click here to see more. Click here to sign up for my watercolor PDF guide and bonus video. Also check out my watercolor essential course where I explain this concept in much more detail. I am Eric from Cafe Watercolor. See you next time.